Okay, I'd like you to turn, please, with me to the book of Revelation and the 17th chapter. I'm going to read the entire chapter. We're going to be looking at the great whore and particularly God's judgment on the great whore. And so it says in verse one, and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Then sh these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sowest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sowest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. Now, Babylon, which is obviously the subject of this particular chapter, uh, has been mentioned already twice in the book of Revelation. Uh, and we saw it in chapter 14, verse 8. It says, uh, there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then we saw it at the end of chapter 16, and particularly verse 19, when this great earthquake occurs at the pouring out of the seventh bowl judgment, and it says the verse 19, the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So clearly Babylon is kind of an integral figure in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's interesting that Babylon is mentioned 287 times in the scriptures. It is mentioned more than any other city except Jerusalem. 
And so many have suggested, and rightly so, that actually the Bible is the, the, is the true tale of two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. <laughs> and uh, we, we're certainly going to see that uh, in the book of Revelation. These two cities figure prominently. So what's going on in chapter 17 is the chronological movements of events are interrupted while John is given a closer look at this object of divine judgment. Remember in chapter 16, verse 19, he said that Babylon had come before in remembrance before God. And of course, it had experienced, many believe, the epicenter of that massive earthquake that will have a worldwide devastating effect will be rebuilt Babylon. And so certainly um, it's a very significant city. And we we want to just look at uh, God wants us uh, through the spirit to, to look at it in more detail and understand why this city comes to remembrance before God and why the judgment upon it is so severe. It is interesting that we have chapter 17 and 18, two chapters taken up with Babylon. And at the end of it, when we get to chapter 19, once judgment on Babylon is complete, what we find in chapter 19, one through six, is the real hallelujah chorus. And we notice in 19 verse one, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah. And a smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And the voice came out of the throne, saying, praise our God, which is again, just a variation, right? Hallelujah is praise the Lord. Here it's praise our God, all ye his servants, ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were a voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So isn't it interesting that this city is so hateful to God that when it's finally destroyed, it, there's an eruption in heaven of the hallelujah chorus. Now, why this is so significant is that when we look at our New Testament, actually hallelujahs are very rare in the New Testament. You might think you'd see them more often. For instance, when the Lord Jesus uh, came into this world, when uh, that glorious incarnation took place. God was manifested in the flesh. You might have thought that somewhere in the text, someone somewhere would let out a hallelujah, but you would be wrong. As far as the text of scripture is concerned, there is none. You would think that when Christ cried out on Calvary, it is finished and won that great victory, there might be some hallelujah somewhere. Now, there may well have been, but as far as Scripture recording it, there is none. You might think at the triumphal resurrection, there might well be a hallelujah inserted somewhere in the text of Scripture, but no. What about his ascension to God's right hand? Nope, no, you won't find it. But where you find the hallelujah chorus is for the destruction of, the fall of Babylon. And so obviously, this is very significant, isn't it? If, it? if it results in a heavenly hallelujah chorus, then this must be a very hateful thing to God. So what are we talking about here with this fall of Babylon? Well, first of all, Babylon uh, is the Greek word. Babel is the Hebrew OK, so just gives a kind of clue here. Babylon, Greek, uh, Babel in Hebrew. Babel, it's interesting that originally uh, the word Babel means the gate of God. But Babel, when it's all joined together without a hyphen, Babel means confusion. And certainly uh, nothing has confused the minds of men more than this Babylonian or Babel system.
Not only was there a confusion of languages, but it has resulted in the confusion of the minds of multitudes. So where's the origin of all this? Well, we know it's Genesis chapter 10. Uh, on the Nimrod, and let's just go back to Genesis. It's amazing how foundational the book of Genesis is. I do believe the reason Satan tries to discredit this book so greatly is that if he can destroy the foundation, the whole structure will collapse. And so this is why we must take Genesis seriously. And so it says, verse 10 of chapter 10, well, we just read from verse 9 or verse 8, Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom, his kingdom, right? Nimrod's kingdom was Babel and Eric and Akkad and Kalna and the land of Shinar. So Nimrod, this mighty hunter before the Lord, is the founder of this place called Babel. And uh, he was the great grandson of Noah. And Babel became very much synonymous with rejection of divine revelation and rebellion, rebellion against God. Look at chapter 11. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad unto the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. They have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go, let us go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the languages of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So this is the beginning of what we call Babylon, Babel. And really it was built in really complete rebellion against God. God had told them that they were to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And they said, no, we don't want to be scattered <laughs> abroad on the face of the earth. We want to stay in one place. And so a defiance against God's uh, command uh, to uh, spread abroad over the whole earth. And then, of course, in this process, uh, let us, again, man is the source, make us, man is the means, a name. And that is, <laughs> the re man is the reason. It's all about man. And Again, for our purposes, I want to focus our attention on verse 4. It said, let us build us a city and a tower. A city and a tower. I want to point out two things um, they intended to build here. First of all, the city. That would correspond with commercial and political Babylon, which is going to be judged in Revelation 18. And, of course, it was a place of commerce, business, and political government. And, again, it's in defiance of, of God, but it's this whole political movement, this, this city. And then the next thing that they were to build was a tower reaching up to heaven. That would can correspond with what we call religious Babylon in chapter 17, a place of idolatry and man-made religion apart from the God of Revelation. Man, as it were, building his way up to heaven in his own efforts and wisdom, rather than depending on God coming down from heaven to rescue man. And Jung's little translation says, this tower, its head in the heavens. And that's kind of the idea. Some even think that perhaps in the roof of it, uh, they had all the uh, kind of the, the stars that, that are connected with, uh, you know, the uh, how people look at their stars and all this kind of stuff and try and determine their their future based on on 
this in the zodiac, so to speak. So basically, I want us to see that in chapter 17, what we are going to be witnessing is the destruction of religious Babylon that corresponds to the tower. And in chapter 18, we're going to be looking at the destruction of political Babylon, the city, the tower and the city. And we'll see there's this significant differences between them. And it's, it's good for us to see the differences between chapter 17 and chapter 18. So what, what are some of the differences? Um, well, first of all, we, we want to notice that the way judgment occurs is different in chapter 17 to chapter 18. In chapter 17, the judgment is indirect. It's the 10 kings that uh, God puts it into their heart, but actually the 10 kings hate the whore and they make a desolate, naked, eater, flesh, burner with fire. Chapter uh, 17, verse 16 and 17, God put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, to agree to give their kingdom to the beast. And so divine judgment is indirect. When it comes to the commercial city, uh, it will be destroyed by this earthquake. So chapter 18, the destruction is a result of the earthquake in chapter 16, verse 19, where it says, uh, again, just verse 18, says there were voices, this is chapter 16, verse 18, thunders, lightnings, there was a great earthquake such as were not since men were upon the earth, a mighty an earthquake so great. So this is a direct judgment Great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So the judgment is very direct. And, and let me just say this, that I believe that there will be a, a time lapse between the judgment on religious Babylon of three and a half years between the judgment on religious Babylon and the judgment on commercial Babylon. So between chapter 17 and 18, there will be a three and a half year time lapse. And why is that? Well, again, because at the midpoint of the tribulation period, I believe God puts it into the heart of these 10 kings that have their, as it were, rule with the beast for a short time to destroy the whore. Because we're going to move from this, this religion of the whore riding the beast to beast worship when his image is going to be set up, the abomination of desolation, and he will not allow for any other worship. There'll be a universal worship of the beast. And so there'll be a three and a half year time gap. I want you to notice too that um, Babylon, again, the uh, word Babylon is mentioned back in uh, the book of Isaiah in chapter 14. And I'd like us just to go there because what we do notice is in this uh, chapter uh, that deals with Babylon from verse four, it says, thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. And then in the midst of describing this down in verse 12, he says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And so what we might suggest is this, that Babylon and the whole Babel system is really linked with Lucifer. It seems at this point in history, chapter 14 of Isaiah, that it was the center of his operations on the earth. The ancient center of Satan's power in the past will reappear in the closing pages of scripture and it will be the world headquarters as it were of his operations so <clears throat> revelation 17 covers a period really from the days of nimrod until the midpoint of the tribulation whereas chapter 18 is just a short period of three and a half years when it all all those centuries in the making where commercial Babylon comes together perfectly in the last days. I want you to notice, too, the, the, we, we talked a lot in chapter 16 
about great things. We said it was a great chapter. And there was a lot of use of that epithet, great. Well, when we get to Babylon, we can't help but notice the use of great again in connection with it. We saw it in chapter 16, verse 19, where it says, and the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So it's mentioned that great Babylon. We notice now in chapter 17, verse one, he says, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. So now Babylon <laughs> described as a great whore, but again, that, that epithet great. Verse 5, upon a forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Notice verse 18 again. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And then we get into chapter 18. Verse 2, he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Uh, verse 10 of chapter 18, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Uh, verse 16, saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. Verse 19, they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping, wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city. Verse 21, a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and she'll be found no more at all. And so very evident, great, this epithet is to be connected with Babylon, both religious Babylon in chapter 17 and with commercial Babylon in chapter 18. So we're saying that the roots of Babylon are ancient, but there'll be a final manifestation. A religious entity supported by the beast and described in metaphorical terms here as the harlot. <clears throat> and um, again, one of the reasons why we see a distinction between chapter 17 and chapter 18 is the differences between the two, two chapters is the way in which Babylon is described differs. And then the overall way Babylon acts differs. And so we might notice that um, in chapter 17, there's a lot of figurative language. But thankfully, the figurative language is explained to us. That's really helpful. And so we we talk about, you know, this this image of the, the beast and the whore riding it. It's all figurative, but then there's there's an explanation of it. Whereas when we get to chapter 18, uh, it's commercial greatness. Uh, there's no figurative language. It's all literal. Uh, it's very com commercially successful. It's, it's, uh, it's producing its goods and selling its goods and merchants are dealing with it. So it's a very literal thing. Also, how they operate is different. Uh, in chapter 17, there's something subtle about the way mystery babylon works it's covertly it's kind of sneaky it's it's deceptive whereas chapter 18 babylon acts overtly very very clear so when we think of religious babylon a lot of people when they look at chapter 17 they come to the conclusion that it's talking about roman catholicism now i just want to say this right at the beginning um, I do believe that Roman Catholicism has had and will have a s significant role in the whore. But I do believe that Babylon, religious Babylon, is much bigger than just 
Roman Catholicism. It may indeed take the lead. It may even head it, head it up. And I can imagine that after the rapture of the church, uh, when the, the true saints are taken out of the way, that perhaps uh, Roman Catholicism will be instrumental in pulling the, the remaining apostate religions, apostate Christendom together, as well as other religions. And they're already working at this. Um, I saw uh, a video of uh, Pope John Paul II uh, bringing together all the shamans and and Muslim mullahs and and the Dalai Lama and all these different individuals uh, to a council on world religions in Assisi, Italy, and they basically made a declaration that they were going to work together to form a cooperative world religion. So it's already beginning to uh, manifest itself. But I do believe in the last days after the rapture of the church, it will come together very smoothly. Commercial Babylon will continue throughout the tribulation and destroyed directly, as we've said, by the seventh bowl judgment. But this, uh, this horror of Babylon will be destroyed at the midpoint. We'll look at that in more detail in a little while. What unifies the two chapters is both are anti-God systems, a religious one and the pursuit of power and prosperity through commercial means away from God. And so they both have that common link. So let's dive in now to the text, having just kind of laid that foundation between uh, the distinctions between chapter 17 and 18, religious Babylon, the tower and commercial Babylon, the city. Notice verse one, then it says, there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials and talked with me. Now, it doesn't tell us which one it is. It may well have been the one that was responsible for the earthquake that we've just noticed in chapter 16 uh, as he carries the the seventh angel pouring out his vial. But we're not specifically told. He's just one of the seven angels which had the seven vials came and talked with me, saying to me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great hall that sits upon many waters. And again, I want us to just notice, uh, again, another contrast between the description here of this Babylonian religious system, God says it's a whore. What a contrast with Revelation 21 and verse 9, where we read this, there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and taught with me, saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And isn't that a marvelous contrast? On the one hand, the true church is the bride, the lamb's wife. The, the false uh, religious system, this, this whore, is going to be connected indelibly, at least in the first three and a half years, with the Antichrist. She will be his whore. Notice it also says, I'll show thee the, the judgment of the great hall that sitteth upon many waters. And again, we said this is figurative language, but the language is explained to us in the text. So what does it mean, sits upon many waters? Well, we don't have to be super intelligent to get the answer because verse 15, it says this, he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the idea is this, that the many waters that she sat upon is the fact that she, she is supported, she is followed by multitudes of people. Uh, thankfully, too, the true bride of Christ contains people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation as well. But again, so these two systems, they have, as it were, worldwide support. One, the bride, the lamb's wife, people from every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. And then this whore that sits on many waters, which are multi people and multitude of nations and tongues. So again, we see that. So the, the whore is linked, as we've said, with the beast and her uh, future. She's doomed. 
the bride, the lamb's wife, well, she's destined for glory. And so what a difference, because he shows you the bride, the lamb's wife, and then he shows the, the heavenly city, the, the new Jerusalem, and, and shows the future abode of the lamb's wife. And what a glorious future there is for the true church of the Lord Jesus. What a terrible future is for the whore. She will be destroyed at the midpoint of the tribulation period. And she will, of course, share the, the destiny of the unsaved for all eternity. But we have to just observe once more um, how Satan is the, the imitator, right? The, the, uh, he's constantly copying God. Uh, he's a counterfeiter. He, he, he just always on always copying and so he's got a kingdom won't last very long but he's going to set up a worldwide kingdom he's got a whore as opposed to a bride he's got his satanic trinity which we saw earlier his pseudo resurrection which we saw every, every ever counterfeiting the the reality and again what what a compliment by the way because you only counterfeit something of value and so the true is absolutely wonderful. And uh, oh, how wonderful it is to be part of the true. And so notice the, the use of the term whore. Um, the word porne, it comes from the verb to sell, uh, usually in a literal sense, selling the body for gain, uh, physically selling. Uh, it, betraying personal purity for pleasure or profit. But there's a, there's a spiritual dimension to it too. It's selling the truth for pleasure and power. And I think that's more what is involved here with this great whore. So notice it says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Interesting how it uses the term fornication as opposed to adultery. And because she's not married, she's a prostitute. She's a used woman, a kept woman, so to speak. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The inhabitants of the earth have drunk of the wine of her fornication. She commits fornication, not adultery. She's never, ever been joined to the Lord. That's why it's fornication as opposed to adultery. She's never been joined to the Lord. There was profession there, but without reality. Now, harlotry is often used in Scripture to describe unfaithfulness to God and his word. And abominations are often used in connection with describing idolatry. And I want us to go back to the book of Ezekiel just for a moment, just to see uh, how this idea of harlotry is used in a spiritual sense uh, in being unfaithful to God and to truth and to his ways. The book of Ezekiel and chapter 16. Ezekiel 16. And we will break in There's many places we could look in this uh, chapter, but we'll break in in verse 26. It says, thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, greater flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger, speaking of the nation of Israel. And then notice further down in verse 28, thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatiable, yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldest not be satisfied. And so again, we see how it's used in a very definitely in a spiritual sense to describe unfaithfulness to God and his word, to turning to idolatry and to that which is false. And we can certainly see that here. Again, we go back to Jeremiah just to see the worldwide pervasive influence of Babylon and of the Babel system. Jeremiah 51 and verse 13. 
and you might keep your finger here because we're going to come back in a moment, but um, it does say, verse 13, it says, <clears throat> well, verse 12, set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon, make the watch strong, set up the watchmen, prepare the ambushes, for the Lord hath both devised and done that which he spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, Thine end is come, and the measure of thy covetousness. And maybe we'll, while we're here, we'll look at verse 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand, and hath made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. So again, just like this worldwide influence. So again, let's just go back to Babel. And if you remember when God confused the languages, what happened then was the confusion of languages, they still had in their hearts the city and the tower. Even though they can't cooperatively work together, when they were spread abroad, it's interesting how ziggurats, like the one that they were building in Babylon, appear around the world. The, in other words, the Babylonian philosophy, the building of cities, uh, the building of towers continued throughout the world. And so the influence of Babel insidiously spread throughout the world. And certainly we see that uh, in our world too, the influence of, of um, the false religious systems around the globe. Now look at the Lord Jesus in Matthew 13. He, I do believe, hinted at the influence of this system in Matthew 13, verse 33, he says, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And so, again, I do believe he has a reference there to the influence, really, of the false uh, teaching of the Babel system, the Babylonian religious system that tries to corrupt the truth. And of course, leaven, it always speaks of sin in its permeating character. And of course, trying to, as it were, leaven the whole system. And certainly we see that. So certainly we'd say this, that Babel or Babylon is the foundation head of the idolatry that overspread the earth after the flood and certainly has a evil influence. And so it says in verse three, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. So the woman is riding on the beast. And of course, when you're riding something, you're seeking to control it. The Lord Jesus, when he comes out of heaven, riding on a white horse, Who's going to be in control, the horse or the Lord Jesus? Well, of course, it's the Lord Jesus. And so when you ride on something, you're trying to bring it under your control. You're trying to use it for your purposes. And so she rides on the back of the beast. And so she's seeking to lead, just as in the case of Eve with Adam. Uh, Ahab, if you remember, was bent to the rule of Jezebel. Herod was manipulated by Herodias. And so, again, the, the same kind of idea here. This, this whore tries to influence the beast riding on him. However, she's deceived because the beast actually is going to use her to accomplish his purpose. Notice, too, that the beast, uh, it talks about um, the names of the beast. It says, I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Full of names means the beast has appeared throughout history in many different guises. We've said that the man of sin has always, or, or Satan has always wanted to put his man on the throne. He's tried before. So, so it's appeared in different guises and always blasphemous because it exalts man and dethrones God. We might say this too, uh, since Constantine embraced Christianity and merged the state's power and paganism together in a state church marriage, 
this horror has been carried along by human governments ever since. The beast allows her to ride on his back until his power is fully established and his need of her is no more. Then, as we're going to see later on in this chapter, he's going to destroy her having accomplished his purpose and in the process doing God's will. And interestingly enough that he's going to do God's will. The, the wrath of man is designed to praise him. I want you to notice too that when he is carried away in the spirit in verse 3 into the wilderness, he saw this woman sit on a scarlet colored beast. It's just an interesting thing where this vision is given. It's in the wilderness. And certainly we could say this, that it's very fitting because um, this, this Babylonian influence religion is a spiritual wilderness to the soul. It will never satisfy. There's nothing in the wilderness to satisfy there, and it will never satisfy. On the other hand, compare Revelation 21. We've already done this before, but it says, verse 9, it says, There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy jerusalem descending out of heaven from god and of course the dwelling place of the bride and so where did he take him to a great high mountain what a difference the wilderness and the high mountain contrasting again one system built on the sand as it were of the desert the wilderness the other on the rock the solid rock and so verse four it says the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. You'd say that wealth and luxury describe her. She's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls and a golden cup. And how different she is to the Lord Jesus who had nowhere to lay his head, you know, who, and, and the early church that had met in homes and was mainly comprised of slaves and was, was just uh, known not for wealth and luxury, but, but often for poverty and persecution, wealth and luxury describe her. Notice her dress and her decorations and her deportment, clearly plying her trade. Of course, to the Jew, the, colors would have a priestly connotation and to the uh, roman uh, it would have a royalty connotation remember when the roman soldiers put a scarlet robe on the lord jesus and and made him into a king and and so this this whore it's interesting there are priestly connotations to this system priestcraft but there's also the fact that she demands to be treated as royalty. And is it interesting that in that papal system, often, you know, people have to kiss the ring of the Pope and they have to bow down before him and he's carried about on a golden throne and all this kind of stuff. Again, how far removed all this stuff is, this religious Babylonian nonsense from the simplicity that there is in Christ. Notice verse five. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. Her name betrays her true character. This, the mystery religions really begun back, we're told historically, the wife of Nimrod was a woman called Semiramis, Semi and a self-proclaimed queen of heaven and the originator of the mother-child cult. Uh, interesting that when Nimrod was killed, uh, she uh, had a child and she claimed that it was virgin born, proclaimed it as the savior, as the seed promised to Eve or, or as Nimrod reborn. 
And so this, this whole mystery religious system has permeated through the centuries and appeared in different ways. And even in, in the word of God, I want you to look at the book of Ezekiel again. And I'm not doing this because I was speaking on Ezekiel all last week, but it is interesting how it fits uh, very clearly. Ezekiel 8, verse 14, when God is saying why his glory can no longer stay in the temple and the reasons why the glory of God had to leave the temple in Jerusalem, the abominations that were seen in there. He says, well, verse 13, he said to me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, that which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And again, just this idea, Tammuz, again, it's this mother-child cult thing. She, again, just a further manifestation of this same thing. Uh, a child uh, claimed to be virgin-born, all the rest of it, just the, the, the same uh, thing that Semiramis taught. Jeremiah 7. I want you to notice prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 18 for all of this, again, religious deception that goes back to Nimrod and Semiramis. Chapter 7, verse 18. It says, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Chapter 44 of Jeremiah. Verse 17. But he will certainly do whatsoever things goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and, and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men. And so again, we just see this pattern uh, throughout the scriptures of this all pervasive cult of worshiping this queen of heaven, the mother uh, child cult and so it says again back in revelation 17 by verse 5 upon her forehead was a name written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth everywhere this mother and child cult was connected with mystic rites ceremonies and often with idolatry because it was connected with fertility Verse 6, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Unparalleled persecution of which she has been guilty. And if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you read Martyr's Mirror, uh, you will see the extent of this persecution. And of course, it's going to continue in the first half of the tribulation period as this one world religion, especially after the rapture, any person that is uh, considered to be opposing that will be martyred. And so notice that John says he wondered with great admiration or with amazement he marveled that word is often translated marveled and the reason is because it wasn't pagan persecution such as he knew in his day uh, he was familiar with persecution of the roman system uh, the roman em empire but but this was religious in nature it was a pseudo church a a false religion that was 
guilty of persecution. And we've said from the very beginning of our study that in the first half of the tribulation, persecution will be based on refusal to join the one world church, to give homage to the whore, the harlot. The second half, persecution will be based on refusing the mark of the beast and worshiping his image. And notice that there are two groups that are mentioned, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and also the blood of the saints. And the blood of the saints would refer, I believe, to both Old Testament saints and tribulation saints, and then those that are the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And so two distinct groups are mentioned, but a common experience, suffering at the hands of this whore that is known as religious Babylon. Well, that's probably a good place for us to stop because from verse 7 onwards, we're going to get the details concerning the beast and exactly who the identity of the beast is and then more details on the woman. So this is a good place for us to stop. But later on, we're told, come out of her, my beloved, have nothing to do with this system. May God deliver his people from it. Amen.